From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Well, hi, Harry. What is it this time? Fraud, murder, arson? No, no, none of them. Then what kind of a case has you in a dither this morning? As a matter of fact, John, there is no case. Oh, now, don't tell me you're spending company money on just a social call. Why, Harry? Of course not. John, I wish you to take a motor trip with one of our very important clients. Well, now, that depends. Perhaps you've heard of her. Betty Charlene Winters. Uh, no, but she sounds interesting. She is. She's one of the most charming people. Very wealthy, too. John, you'll love her. Oh, tell me more. I want you to accompany her to her summer place on Lake Wawayande in northern New Jersey. Sounds better all the time. On expense account, of course, plus a fee of $1,000 for the week or any fraction thereof. How can I lose? Harry, I'll grab the first train. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward widow matter. Expense account item one, twenty-one fifty, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Philadelphia. At his office on Walnut Street, Harry Branson looked as though he'd been just sitting there waiting for me ever since his phone call. I'll get straight to the point, John. Well, good, good. You uh, don't mind if I sit down first, though, do you? Oh, no, no, of course not. Ah. As I told you on the telephone, Mrs. Winters is one of our... Mrs.? Most... You didn't tell me that. Her husband died just a short time ago. Oh, oh. And you, the old friend of the family, have been consoling the lovely widow, eh? John. Yeah, when you pick him, you really pick him, Harry. Hey, do you remember that little brunette you went for in the last case I handled with John, you? John, that has nothing whatsoever to do with the matter at hand. Yeah, okay, maybe not. Oh, but you sly dog. I'm betting right now you wish you could make this trip to the lake instead of me. Of course I do. The beautiful forests and mountains up there at this time of the year. <laughs> oh, sure. Just for the scenery. All right, now tell me all. Well, the Winters were very wealthy. Betty Charlene Winters still is. Thanks, among other things, to the half million dollars she received on her late husband's double indemnity policy. Half a million? You make this sound more attractive every minute. John, will you... You don't suppose the gorgeous babe helped him have an accident in order to collect that? John, you are being absurd. Am I? Tell me this. Was he older than she? Yes, he was. Uh Aha. And two and two make four. And you are making no sense at all. Hey, you have got a case on her, haven't you? Will you please stop this nonsense and listen to me? Now, as I started to say, their lovely home is out between Ardmore and Bryn Mawr. All right, go on. Their home, which Mr. Winters inherited from his father and his grandfather before him, is a veritable art gallery. I see. But she is going to dispose of most of it to the better-known museums and galleries. She plans to sell the family mansion, too, just as soon as the estate is settled. Doesn't go for the old stuff, huh? You're quite right. Her taste is uh, more for the modern. Uh, that's the way I like them. Uh, I beg your pardon? Mm, nothing. Go on, Harry. Uh, yes. Some of the things, however, she is taking up to the summer home on Lake Wawa Yanda. Oh, well, now, wait a minute, Harry. Am I taking Betty Charlene up Mrs. There? Winters, John, please. Okay, I'll stay out of your territory for the time being. But am I being hired to take her up to the lake or just some of this junk you've been talking about? Both. Ah. Oh. You see, there's one thing in particular, some statue or other, that she wants help with. Statue, huh? So you and she and the statue will make the trip. Now, that's the kind of chaperone I like. When do we start? I must confess it's quite a relief to get out of that office for a while. Oh, don't try to kid me, Harry. The only reason you wouldn't let me find my own way out to this winter babe's home. Babe! Honestly, John, you sometimes carry this levity much too far. By the way, how long ago did her husband die? About, um, four months ago. Oh, brother, you don't even wait for the ashes to get cold, do you? John, I tell you that... What did he die of? Well, it, uh, it was an accident. Yeah? In the car during a little trip that they were making south of here. He'd taken over the wheel from the chauffeur. They struck the abutment of a bridge over a tidal creek leading out to Delaware Bay. Oh. He was thrown out, and his body was carried into the bay. It was never recovered. 
And so our tasty little dish was left with a quarter million life insurance, a huge estate... John, I simply will not listen to any more of this sort of nonsense. Besides, this is the driveway up to the house. Ah, lovely place, isn't it? It was lovely. There must have been over an acre of perfectly tended lawns and gardens. And in the middle, atop a slight rise, was the main house, built of solid white stone of some sort. Old, too, but in beautiful condition. This was wealth, all right, and plenty of it. Harry's year-old car looked almost tawdry in this setting. We stopped, went up the broad front steps and across a wide porch and rang the doorbell. Yes? Oh, Mr. Branson. That's right. Uh, Mrs. Winters is waiting for you in the sunroom. Thank you. Come, John. The butler led us through a large reception room, a huge living room. Both of them hung with beautiful prints and paintings. Through the walnut panel library with its high ceiling and hundreds of leather-bound books... Finally, after passing through a long corridor lined with statues and magnificent vases, we entered the spacious sunroom. There, standing in front of a chair at the window, was a chauffeur. And in the chair sat Betty Charlene Winters. Mrs. Winters, may I present special investigator John Dollar. <laughs> wow. Well, she was a cute little thing, that I will say. But instead of a young, blonde, and beautiful, well, let's face it, she was 70 if she was a day. All my dreams of a high old time during a week at a mountain lake suddenly vanished into thin air. How nice of you to come, Mr. Dollar. Investigated, did you say, Mr. Branson? Yes. I see. Well, don't just stand there. Sit down and be comfortable, both of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Is something wrong, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, no, uh, not at all. Oh, Haskins, here's my chauffeur and general handyman. Hi, Haskins. Mr. Dollar. I've just asked him to get the statue ready for our little trip. Oh, you may go now, Haskins. Oh, thank you, madame. Uh, no, wait, please. I, uh, I wonder if I might see this thing we're taking up to the lake, Mrs. Winters. Well, of course, it's right there in the corner behind you, Mr. Dollar. The cherub. Cherub, huh? Oh, I... This? Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> Well, it was a cherub, all right, uh, about four feet high with a couple of doves fluttering around its feet. At least that's what I gathered from the garish paint on it. Believe me, it looked like something a third grader had slapped together as a joke on his modeling class. Now, I'm no artist, but so help me, I could have done better myself with a handful of mud and with my eyes closed. No family peak, Mr. Dollar. Antique. I started to say what I was thinking, but then Haskins lifted the atrocity off its pedestal and left with it. Haskins has made a special box for it. He'll place it in the car so we can leave with it tomorrow. You are ready to leave on such short notice, aren't you, Mr. Dollar? Well, uh, now look, Mrs. Winters, yes, I... Uh... Yes, his luggage is right outside in my car, Mrs. Winters. Then, Eric, you may fetch it and put it in one of the guest rooms. Uh, very good, madam. By the way, I hope you know how to drive a Pierce Arrow, Mr. Dollar. Pierce? Or did you think perhaps Haskins would drive us up to the lake? Well, I, I don't know. No. Haskins is leaving today on his vacation. And I wonder if he will come back. Why do you say that, Mrs. Winters? Oh, I've been having some trouble with him. Oh? I thought you were always eminently satisfied with Haskins. Until recently. Until the death of my husband. He's been... Well, if he doesn't come back, I shall have to replace him. But now, Mr. Branson... Yes? You're a bit of a rascal. You didn't tell me you were bringing a detective to go along with me. Investigator, Mrs. Winters. Insurance investigator. Since the company wouldn't permit me to issue any special insurance on that... that thing... But I, I thought you were going to bring me just some strong little bodyguard. I have known John for many years, Mrs. Winters, and I assure oh, you... Oh, now, don't apologize. I think this is fine. I just hadn't expected so much. Such a nice, good-looking young... But now come, Mr. Dollar, and I'll show you the rest of the house. We spent the next hour or so on a tour of the place, and Mrs. Winters pointed out the various works of art destined for specific museums and galleries all over the country after she moved out, after the estate was settled. Then Eric caught up with us and announced that Haskins had created the statue and placed it in the car. You know, I was curious about that car, so we went out to the garage and inspected it. It was a Pierce Arrow, all right. Vintage of 1928, complete with headlights on top of the fenders 
and as bright and shiny as the day it was made. When I tried the starter, it purred like a contented kitten. Uh, with a bass voice, that is. Along about five o'clock, Mrs. Winters, with a sparkle in her eye, announced it was cocktail time. Harry, being a teetotaler, decided to leave, but not before I buttonholed him for a quick conference. What doesn't make sense, John? Oh, that silly statue, Harry. All the fuss over that piece of junk. After all, John, with all the big policies she carries with us on the legitimate artwork, well, we just can't afford to displease her. But if it had any real value... Perhaps it does to her. How can it? Unless she has a lot of jewelry hidden away in the base of it or something. Hmm. What, John? A cocktail, she said, and I'm sure ready for him. Go on back to Philly, Harry, and wait for my final report. Well, I must admit that Betty Charlene Winters turned out to be a charming hostess, a very interesting conversationalist. Even long after dinner, over brandy and cigarettes, we chattered away like a couple of magpies. I didn't question her about the statue because I wanted to find out more about it on my own hook. Finally, about midnight, we decided to retire, had a nightcap, and went to our respective room. But instead of going to bed, I sat around and read for a few minutes, turned off the light, waited a few minutes more. Then, quietly, I slipped out of my room. That was a mistake. For as I reached the end of the long hall to the stairway, a door behind me suddenly opened. Huh? Who's there? I said, who's... Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. With the bigger, more impressive kaleidoscopic change of events on the world scene today, we sometimes forget the smaller kaleidoscope, the child's toy, with its ever-changing designs and color. The kaleidoscope is a fantastic experience for any child. That is, any child who can see. But what of those children who cannot experience the ecstatic pleasures of form and color in the ever-changing world about them... This problem has bothered many, and many such people have tried to solve it. One-time soldier in the United States Army, Robert Neiman, is one of them. Captain Kenneth Moyer, also of the Army, is another. Both men, while stationed in Japan recently, set about the task of raising funds for the purpose of providing eye examinations and operations for sightless Japanese children. In return for this gesture, Japanese eye surgeons did not charge for their services. For those children who could not be cured, Braille typewriters were purchased and donated for training purposes in the hope of giving a few more people useful lives. Both Neiman and Moyer worked independently of each other. Neither knew of the other's interest in such a gratifying project. Both have continued the work with enthusiasm. The results of their efforts, when a blind child sees again or perhaps for the first time, that is their reward. For a child... As for an adult, new sight leads to understanding. And understanding is a building block of freedom. The right of all men, everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Widow Matter. When I came to, it was morning. And I found myself in my pajamas lying comfortably in my bed in the guest room. But there was nothing comfortable about the lump on the back of my head. Whoever had slugged me out there in the hall had meant business. I got up painfully, went down the hall, and made a quick check of the room from which the attacker had surprised me. It was just another guest room. I showered, dressed, and went downstairs, where I found Mrs. Winters at the breakfast table. She was very much distressed over what had happened and suggested we go out and look in the trunk of the car immediately. There, now. Do you see, Mr. Dollar, the box with the statue in it hasn't been touched. I don't understand it. Where is your chauffeur, Mrs. Winters? Well, Haskins left on his vacation last evening. I thought I told you. But surely you don't think Haskins... Well, you said you were having trouble with him. Maybe we'd better open that box to make sure that... Oh, but it hasn't been touched. And I'm the only one who has a key to that little lock on it. Yeah, I see. But now it's pretty logical to assume that whoever slugged me last night was interested in... Hey, Mrs. Winters, how long has Eric, your butler, been with you? Why, Eric, the dear boy, has been with me for nearly 30 years. But 
Good heavens, you surely don't suspect him of anything like this. He's a very fine person, Mr. Dollar, and a perfect gentleman. Oh, certainly more of a gentleman than my late husband ever was, in spite of his money. Oh. I must confess that although his death was a terrible shock, I... Well, life has been a great deal easier for me since he passed away. Just how do you mean that, Mrs. Winters? No, well, why talk about it? Something that... Oh... Oh, why not talk about it? I married Charles for his money, Mr. Dollar. I'd never got any further than the front line of the chorus until he came along. Would you believe that I was a chorus girl? Well, as a matter of... And the wealth and the luxury that he could give me was very attractive, was very satisfying for a long, long time. But for the past 10 or 15 years, maybe more, he insisted that we just stay penned up in this musty old museum he called a home. And what happened? Well, all our friends were traveling around the world, seeing new places and new people. We just sat here looking at four walls and at each other. Except for a couple of blessed months up at the lake. You love the place up there, Mr. Dollar. It's new and fresh and modern. I had it built over his protest. People, young people came to see us, and it was such a relief from a... Oh, well, I'm sorry. This must be so boring for you to hear. Not at all. Now, look. Why don't we call the police in about this thing that has happened to you? Come, we'll go right back into the house and... Wait a minute, call... wait a minute. No, let's not. A bunch of policemen prowling around would scare him off, whoever he is. But suppose you're attacked again. Well, at least I'm ready for it now. I just don't like your taking this chance. Of course, we could leave. Go up to the lake. Run away from him? Well, yes. Oh. Of course, it might prove whether he's interested in the statue. If he follows us, I mean. Oh, dear. Why don't you let me call the police? Only if you think they ought to be around here to protect the house while we're gone. No, no, that isn't necessary. We have a very efficient burglar alarm system. Well, it doesn't look as though it was working very well last night, does it? Unless it was someone in the house who attacked me. Who else is there besides you and Eric? No one, except the cook. Male or female? Oh, no, no, Mr. Dollar, not Martha. Why, the poor dear is nearly as old as I am. And a real companion for me. Sounds strange, I know. But we're real nice friends. All right, let's go back in, have our breakfast, pack our things, and go on up to the lake. Eric, who served the breakfast and whom I hadn't seen since dinner last evening, kept giving me a rather strange look. And as soon as breakfast was over, I quickly stuffed my things into my handbag and headed down to the garage. Eric was waiting for me there. He insisted that he put my things into the trunk of the car, which killed any chance I might have had to pry open the box with a statue. I started to question him about the night before. But as it turned out, my questions were quite unnecessary. Uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, it was I who carried you back to your room and put you to bed. Oh? You see, I was making a final inspection of the house, as I always do after everyone else has retired. I'm always concerned about the many valuable things we have. I don't blame you. Well, I was on my way up the main staircase when I heard you fall. I was slugged. Uh, forgive me, sir, but uh, when I found you there at the head of the stairs, I thought your condition was due to... Uh, you must pardon me, sir, but was due perhaps to having imbibed too much brandy after dinner? Not a bit of it. Somebody barged out of that guest room and struck me from behind. But I saw no sign of anyone else about. You're sure? Most certain, sir. Was this fancy burglar alarm system you have turned on? Yes, sir. Well, then whoever did it either stayed in the house until this morning or knew the place well enough to get out without setting off the alarm. But I don't see how that would be... Have you called the police, sir? No, and we're not going to. Mrs. Winters and I are leaving for the lake just as quickly as possible. Uh, but don't you think this is sufficiently serious to warrant... Don't forget one thing, Eric. It was pretty dark in that hall. The attack might have been intended for you. Good heavens. But why, sir? I don't know. Oh, dear. Oh, there you are. Eric, you may fetch my bags from my room while Mr. Dollar and I plan the trip. Uh, very well, madam. Oh, you don't know how glad I'll be to get there. It's such a relief from this place. And all the things associated with it. I'll be so glad when Charles' estate is settled and I can sell this old house and just Martha and I can stay at the lake. Oh, I know all the paintings and things are all very fine and valuable. 
But I'm so tired of looking at them. Well, then why do you take this so-called... I beg your pardon, the statue up to the lake? Well, this is different. Oh, yeah, I'll grant you it is a bit different from the other things. It... Oh, well, let's talk about it along the way. But we didn't, simply because I didn't bring up the subject again. Why not? Because a couple of pretty wild ideas had begun to peck away at the back of my brain. Ideas just crazy enough to have some basis in fact. The 1928 Pierce Arrow ran like a dream in spite of its advanced age. And Mrs. Winters, in spite of her advanced age, kept the conversation going at a merry clip. There was a sparkling, almost buoyancy about her. And the hunch that had hit me began to grow. We crossed the Delaware River at New Hope on Route 202, and in Lambertville, we stopped at the sign of the Flying Red Horse to gas up the car. That's item 2470. While the attendant was busy with that and checking the tires and battery and so forth, I made some excuse or other and stepped around to the telephone booth at the back. Harry Branson here. Harry, I want you to drive out to the Winter's home at Bryn Mawr again. Oh, what for? Just do it, right away. Then call me up at the lake. Well, whatever you say, John, but I wish you'd tell me... Gotta go now. Goodbye. The rest of the trip through the pretty North Jersey countryside was uneventful. And finally, north and east of the little town of Andover, we came to Lake Wawayanda. We drove along a private road to the far end of it, and there, perched on a little cliff above a deep basin, was a real smart, modern brick-and-glass home. That's right. Straight up the little hill and park in front of the garage. Little hill? I just hope we can make it. Right here. I hope the brakes will hold. Or this thing could roll right on back into the lake. Oh, and the lake is so deep right there. Nearly a hundred feet. An old mine or something before the water came up. Oh, this is a pretty dangerous driveway. Here now, let me help you. Thank you. One of the first things I'm going to do is have this driveway built up and leveled off in a big stone wall built around. Yeah, you'd better. Careful now. This is pretty steep. Oh, listen. Yeah? Telephone is ringing inside the house. Oh, well, let me have the key and I'll go in and answer it for you. I'll answer it. You can unpack the car while I do. I suspected the call was from me, but didn't want to say as much. So I opened the car trunk and proceeded to take out the luggage and the big clumsy box for the statue. The box was heavy, very heavy. And I wondered how Haskins, the chauffeur, had been able to pick up and carry the statue so easily back in Bridmore. I finally got the box perched on the edge of the car trunk when Mrs. Winters called to me. It's for you, Mr. Dollar. It's Mr. Branson. Oh, okay, I'll take it. Leaving the box there on his precarious perch, I went on up to the house. in the front hall, Mr. Dollar. Oh, all right, thanks. I'll go on out to the car and get my coat and purse. Yeah. Johnny Dollar. John, this is awful. Terrible. As I just told Mrs. Winters, this is... Well, I, I couldn't believe it. But how, how did you know? How did I know what? Eric, the butler. Yeah? Dead. He's dead. And John, I... Dead from what? How did he die? He apparently fell down the main staircase. The poor cook, Martha, is the only other person in the house. She's beside herself. Yeah, I'll bet she is. But whatever made you suspect something was wrong out here? Call the police, Harry. Make sure they look for a possible blow on the head that might have been delivered before he fell. Mr. What? Donna! Mr. Donna's going to fall! Uh, so long, Harry. Oh, dear. Oh, Mr. Dollar, oh, dear. Ah. Fell off the back of the car, huh? Yes, the big box. I must have bumped it when I reached into the trunk for my weekend case. Bounced right down into the lake, huh? Yes, my beautiful little statue is at the bottom of the lake. Oh, well, don't worry, Mrs. Winters. We'll get it back. I'll have a diver come up here. No. No. It's all right. We'll leave it there. Huh? No, no, you were right. It'd only be another memory of the musty old house in Brenoir. It really has no place here where everything is so fresh and new and clean. We'll get it back. But it really had no actual value. You were right, Mr. Dollar. It's better to just... Yes, we'll leave it there. Sorry, Mrs. Winters, but that's where you're wrong. Why, Mr. Dollar... We'll get it back, all right. And whatever's in it. Oh, dear... 
I suppose I might have known. Expense account item three, $290 even for the diver who came over from New York and retrieved the box from the deep hole in the lake. Two boxes, as a matter of fact. One with Haskins' body in it, and the other with the body of Charles Winters. The body that was supposed to have been washed out to sea after a car accident. The story? Well, of course. After Haskins got rid of Charles for me, I had to do something about him. Or rather, we did. Martha, you know. He's such a wonderful friend. Was Haskins the one who slugged me? Yes, yes. So foolish of him, wasn't it? But he'd heard Mr. Branson say you were an investigator and it frightened him. Worried me a little, too. Well, he might have killed you, too, if Eric hadn't stopped him. And, of course, Eric knew that Haskins had unwittingly made this second box for his own body. So now Eric's gone. Martha, huh? Yes, she did it. But she had to put him away. Oh, yeah. You see, he was the one who took care of Haskins for us. But we couldn't have him around knowing everything. Oh, dear. Martha and I had planned so many wonderful things together. But now... Oh, dear. Expense account total, including incidentals and transportation back to Hartford, three hundred sixty-five fifty. Remarks? Well, I'd rather not say how I feel about a case like this, Harry. A whole crime wave by a couple of apparently sweet old ladies. The legal procedures, and there'll be plenty of them, are up to you and the company, as well as recovery of the insurance paid on poor old Charles Winters. Hey, next time, give me a case that doesn't turn my stomach, will you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a taste of the Old West and a taste of lead from a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dog. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, and Frank Gerstle. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Joe Walters speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.